recording to the cloud. How many participants do we have? Nine, 10, 11. Hopefully the rest of you guys will show up. And let's start, we'll continue with chapter five. I only got really through the geometric and the archaic periods. And as I said earlier, sometimes in, depending on the text, and it's important for you to know this because you may have to do some research on this at some time. Sometimes those two terms are conflated and they're not like a distinct separate change. A lot of times these periods overlap. And so I'm saying that now because that's really going to be kind of the case for a number of things that we do. Uh, but ancient Greece, right now, I wanted to kind of go right to, back to the Parthenon. And uh, what I wanted to do with that is that, uh, to me, I think this is one of the most, if not the most important part of the Greek legacy, partly because it represents high Greek culture. And if you would take a look at how the Greeks sort of looked at the world, you would know that there, everything was kind of, how should I say this? Uh, in service of architecture. So a lot of the statues and things that we know about were made for buildings. And so that, that doesn't diminish their quality, but it does establish a kind of priority. Today, we do sculpture. It's typically a separate discipline from architecture. Anybody know about the 2% rule? Ever heard of this? Well, I'll tell you. In the 1960s, and it's been abolished in a big way, but in the 1960s, the government put forth a 2% rule. And that was when the government gave permission for architects to erect these big skyscrapers, they had to set aside 2% of the cost of the building for artwork. And so that artwork could take a lot of different forms. Interior, you go into the lobby and you see this gigantic painting, but it was a real boom for sculptors. And so you see a lot of stuff from that time uh, is in the art history books now. If you go to Chicago, anybody ever seen the Chicago Picasso Bull? It's in Dealey Plaza, big, huge Picasso sculpture. How about on a smaller scale? Who's from Clayton? And in one of the corners, I mean, it might be like Y down or one of the cross streets. Anyway, there's a corner there that has a beautiful Ernest Trova sculpture, stainless steel, abstract, out of that era. But at any rate, I digress. I want you to see and know more about this. And so I brought in a YouTube video. It's actually a Khan Academy video. Um, and they talk about this building. And another part that I really like about this video is that you get some shots from the inside, from the outside, from far away. It's a three-dimensional work and video does a better job of showing you that better job than say a still photo. And so we'll start today 
with this. And I got to tell you another thing. This was like real crazy because I got this video and it had a URL of Smart History. Then it had one of Khan Academy. And then the one that I ended up downloading ended up being a YouTube. So it's all over the place. But I checked it out. Can you guys at home hear that? We're looking at the Parthenon. This is a huge marble temple to the goddess Athena. We're on the top of a rocky outcropping in the city of Athens, very high up, overlooking the city. It's not showing the video on the screen. Now, Athens was just one of many Greek city states. And almost okay, everyone just to say. Populace, that is, had a fortified. Yeah. And so can you guys hear this at home? We can hear it. We just can't see anything. Oh. That's weird. Let's see. Is there a way I can get this? Can you see it now? We're looking at the parking lot. This is a huge marble temple to the gods. We can't see it. We just see your slideshow still. Ah. And just when I thought we had now Athens was just one of many Greek city states. And almost every say what here. I think I know what you mean because I've had slideshow and can you like um not minimize it but just enough like the box is the screen. Oh if you're like can you see anything you can see like um the green box like highlighted around it, you can drag it on. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it is. Um, how about previews? Nope. Uh, and show. And okay. And this should try and use your share. Yeah, share. Cover back down on the bottom of the screen. Yeah. And go up a little bit. Okay, press new share. Press new share. New share. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um and yeah. That one. Yeah, good. Yeah. Or actually press screen. That way it'll change yeah. on everything. Yeah. yeah. And so you guys at home. Yes. See it and hear it. I can hear you. Yes, we can see it. I can see. This building has had tremendous influence, not only because it becomes the symbol of the birth of democracy, but also because of its extraordinary architectural refinement. The period when this was built in the century. Considered the high classical moment, and for so much of Western history, we have measured our labor achievements against this perfection. It's hard not to recognize some of the buildings in the Midwest, and there's certainly an association, especially with the buildings in Washington, D.C., and that's not a coincidence. Because this is the birthplace of democracy. It was a limited democracy, but a democracy in the Midwest. There's a series of reforms in the 6th century in Athens that allowed more and more people to participate in the government. We think that the city of Athens had between 300 and 400,000 inhabitants, and only about 50,000 were actually considered citizens. If you were a woman, obviously, if you were a slave, you were not participating in this democratic experiment. This is a very limited idea of democracy. So this building is dedicated to Athena. And in fact, the city itself is named after her. And of course, there's a myth of two gods vying for the honor of being the patron of this city. The two gods are Poseidon and Athena. Poseidon is the god of the sea. And Athena has many aspects to the gods. Wisdom, she is associated with 
for an intelligence about creating and making things. Both of these gods gave the people of the city a gift that they may have to choose. The sign strikes the rock, and from it springs forth the salt water of the sea. This had to do with the gift of naval superiority. But Athena offered, in contrast, an olive tree. The idea of the land, of prosperity, of peace. The Athenians chose Athena's gift. There actually is a site here on the Acropolis where the Athenians believe you could see the mark of the from the side and really struck the ground, and also the tree that Athena offered. Actually, the modern view is a reflected olive tree in that space. Let's talk about the building. It is really what we think of when we think of a Greek temple, but the style is specific. This is a Doric temple. Although it has ionic elements, which we'll get to. So the dark features are really easy to identify. You have massive columns with shallow, broad flutes and vertical lines. Those columns go down directly into the floor of the temple, which is called the skylight. And at the top, the capitals are very simple. There's a little flare that rises up to a simple rectangular block called an abacus. And just above that are triglyphs and metaphys. So it's important to say that this building's probably the sculpture. There was sculpture in the Medicaid, there was sculpture in the pediments, and in an unprecedented way, a frieze that ran all the way around all four sides of the building, just inside this outer row of columns that we see. Now, this is an ionic feature. So our history talks about how this building combines Doric elements with ionic elements. And in fact, there were four ionic columns inside the west end of the temple. When the citizens of Athens walked up the sacred way, perhaps for a religious procession or festival, they encountered the west end, and they walked around it, either on the north or south sides, the east end, the entrance. Right above the entrance, in the sculpture of the tenement, they could see the story of Athena and Poseidon vying to be the patron of the city of Athens. On the frieze, just inside, they saw themselves, perhaps, at least in one interpretation, involved in the Panathenaic procession, the religious procession in honor of the goddess Athena. And so this was a building that you walked up to, you walked around, and inside was this gigantic sculpture of Athena. These were all sculptures that we believe were overseen by the great sculptor Phidias. And one of my favorite parts are the metaphys, carved with scenes that showed the Greeks battling various enemies either directly or metaphorically. The Greeks battle in the Amazons, the Greeks against the Trojans, the Lapids against the Centaurs, and the Giantometry, the Greek gods against the Titans. So all of these battles signified the ascendancy of Greece and of the Athenians, of their triumphs, civilization over barbarism, of rational thought over chaos. And you just hit on the very name of this building. This is not the first temple to have been on this site. Just a little bit to the right, as we look at the east end, there was an older temple to Athena that was destroyed when the Persians invaded. This was a devastating blow to the Athenians. One really can't overstate the importance of the Persian War for the Athenian mindset that created the Parthenon. Athens was invaded, and beyond that, the Persians sacked the Acropolis, sacked the sacred site, the temples destroyed the buildings. They broke them down. In fact, the Athenians took a vow that they would never remove the ruins of the old temple to Athena. So they would remember it forever. But a generation later, they did. They did. Well, there was a peace that was established with the Persians, and some historians think that that allowed them to renege on that vow. And Pericles, the leader of Athens, embarked on this enormous, very expensive building campaign. Historians believe that he was able to fund that because the Athenians had become the leaders of what is called the Delian League, an association of Greek city-states that paid a kind of tax to help protect Greece against Persia. But Pericles dipped into that treasury and built this building. This alliance of Greek city-states, their treasure, their tax money, their tribute was originally located in Delos, hence the name Delian League, but Pericles managed to have that treasure moved here to Athens and actually housed in the Acropolis. And the sculpture of Athena herself, which was made of gold and ivory, Phidias said, give me money. We can melt down the enormous amount of gold that decorates the sculpture of Athena. And since that sculpture doesn't exist any longer, we know somebody did that. <laughs> 
So we need to imagine this building not pristine and white, but rather brightly colored, and also a building that was used. It was a storehouse. It was the treasury. And so we have to imagine it was absolutely full of valuable stuff. In fact, you have records that give us some idea of what was stored here. We think about temples or churches or mosques as places where you go in to worship, but that's not how Greek religion worked. There usually was an altar on the outside where sacrifices were made, and the temple was the house of the Valor Goddess. But with the Parthenon, our historians and archaeologists have not been able to locate an altar outside. So we wondered what was this building? So one answer is it was a treasure. But it also functions symbolically. It is up on this hill. It commands this extraordinary view from all parts of the city. And so it was a symbol of the city's wealth and power. And it's a gift to Athena when you make a gift to your patron goddess. You want visitors to be awed by the image of the goddess that was inside and of her home. And this isn't any goddess, this is the goddess of wisdom. So the ability of man to understand our world and its rules mathematically and then to express them in a structure like this is absolutely appropriate. And Ichthyus was a supreme mathematician. And we know that the Greeks, even in the archaic period before this, were concerned with ideal proportions. The Pythagoras. Or the sculptor Polycritus and the sculpture of the Dorypheus, searching for perfect proportions and harmony and using mathematics as the basis for building that grid. And we have that here. To an unbelievable degree. What's extraordinary is that this perfection is an illusion based on a series of subtle distortions that actually correct for the imperfections of our sight. That is, the Greeks recognized that human perception was itself flawed and that they needed to adjust for it in order to give the visual impression of perfection. And their mathematics and their building skills were precise enough to be able to pull this off. Every stone was cut to fit precisely. Well, when we look at this building, we assume it's right over here, it's full of right angles. And in fact, there's hardly a right angle in this building. There's another interpretation of these tiny deviations that these deviations give the building a sense of dynamism, a sense of the organic, that otherwise it would seem static and lifeless. The Greeks had used this idea that our historians call in cases or in order to do slight adjustments, for example, columns bulge toward the center. So this is not new, but the degree to which it's used here and the subtlety in the way it's used is unprecedented. Well, for instance, again, those are our columns. You can see that there's a paper and you assume that it's a straight line, but the Greeks wanted ever so slight a sense of the organic, the, the way that the building was being expressed in the bulge, the intensis of the column about a third of the way from the bottom. But in this case, every single column bulges only 11 sixteenths of an inch, the entire length of that column. The way that the Greeks pulled this off is they would bring the column drums up to the site, they would carefully carve the base and the top, and then they would carve it between. So we see this slight deviation in the columns. We also see it not only vertically, but also horizontally in the building. Well, that's right. You assume that the stylobite, the floor of the temple, is flat, but it's not. Rainwater would run off it because the edges are lower than the center. But only very, very slightly lower. Across the long side of the temple, the center rises only four and three eighths of an inch. And on the short sides of the temple, on the east and the left side, the center rises only by two or three eight inches. But what happens is it corrects. Our eye would naturally see a straight line, seeing as if it rises up at the corners a little bit. So it seems to us to be perfectly flat. The columns are only leaning in a little bit. And you would expect the columns to be equally distant from one another. But in fact, the columns on the edges are slightly closer to one another than the columns in the center of each side. And architectural historians have hypothesized that the reason for this is because the column at the edge is, in a sense, an orphan. It doesn't have anything past it. And therefore, it would seem to be less substantial. So if we could move that column a little bit closer to the one next to it, it might compensate, and it would have a even sense of density across the building. Placing the columns closer together on the edges created a problem in the levels above. One of the rules of the Doric order is that there had to be a trigraph right above the center of a column or in between each column. But they also wanted the trigraphs to be at the very edge. So one trigraph would abut against another trigraph at 
feet corner of the building. And if in fact you're placing your columns closer together, you can actually solve for that problem. You can avoid the stretch of the metaphase in between those triangles that would result. But because the columns are placed so close together, they have the opposite problem, which is to say that the metaphases at the ends of the building would be too slender. So what Phidias has done in concert with Victimus and Calafrates, the architects, is to create sculptural metaphases that are widest in the center, just like the spaces between the columns. And actually, the metaphases themselves gradually become thinner as you move to the edges so that you can't really even perceive the change without measuring. And the general proportions of the building can be expressed mathematically as x equals y times 2 plus 1. So across the front, we see 8 columns, and along the sides, 17 columns. That ratio also governs the spacing between the columns and its relationship to the diameter of the columns. Math is everything. We look at a plan of the structure. We see the exterior colonnade on all four sides. On the east and west end, it's actually a double colonnade. And on the long sides, inside the columns, a solid masonry wall. You can enter rooms on the east and west only. The west has a smaller room with the boring columns within it, but the east room is larger and has the monumental sculpture of Athena. It's interesting, the system that was used to create a vault that was high enough to enclose a sculpture that was almost 40 feet high was unique. There was a U shape of interior columns at two stories. They were north and they surrounded the walls. The sculpture is now lost, but the building is almost lost as well. Here we come to one of the great tragedies of Western architecture. This building survived into the 17th century. It was in pretty good shape for 2,000 years, and it's only in the modern era that it became a ruin. First, it was a you know, major Greek temple for Athena. Then it became a Greek Orthodox church, then a Roman Catholic church, and then a mosque. In a war between the Ottomans, who were in control of Greece at this moment in history in the 17th century, and the Venetians, the Venetians attacked the Parthenon. The Ottomans used the Parthenon to hold munitions, gunpowder. Gunpowder exploded from the inside, basically ripping the guts out of the Parthenon. And then to add insult to injury, in the 18th century, Lord Elgin received permission from the Turkish government to take sculptures that had already fallen off the temple and bring them back to England. And the lion's share of the great sculptures of Phidias are now in London. Greece recently has built a museum just down the hill from the Acropolis, specifically intended to house these sculptures should the British ever release them. Some have argued that Elgin saved the sculptures that would have been further damaged had they not removed them. But what to do about the future is uncertain. And at least one theory states that this building was paid for by the Thunder Treasury from the Golden League. So there's a long history of contested ownership. So as we stand here, very high up on the Acropolis, overlooking the Aegean Sea, islands beyond, and mountains on the safari say, I can't help but imagine standing inside the Parthenon between those columns, which we can't do today. The site is undergoing tremendous restoration. There are cranes and scaffolding to maintain the ruin and not the fall of course this repair. But if we could stand there, what would it feel like? There is this beautiful balance between the theoretical and the physical. The Greeks thought about mathematics as the way that we could understand the divine. And here it is in our world. There's something about the Parthenon that is both an offering to Athena, the protector of Athens, but also something that's a monument to human beings, to the Athenians, to their brilliance. And by extension, I suppose, in the modern era, the human spirit generally. <laughs> And so, yes, Charlotte. I studied this, um, the Parthenon and Greek um, temples uh, very extensively in my painting class. Um, yeah. And so we learned that specifically this building, since it's about Athena, um, normally our temples with um, eight columns in the front were for women. But normally they'd also be ionic capitals. Um, but since Athena is a 
stronger than the typical guys, they gave you a word uh, categories. And um, so that's, yeah. That is, yeah. That's a very good point you're making. And yeah, that is generally, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about that too. And that is that the ionic is always or almost always, except in this case, the feminine. And uh, even to the point where on these columns, these have what? dark edges. Sam, I am. Uh, okay, who's good? But these are, are very sharp, and the ionic, the fluting on the ionic is there's a flat space. So it was, I think I have some of that. Good point. And Athena was, yeah, this could be uh, the original feminist. I like it. And so there was the video. And yeah, I wondered if they made mention of this. And, and this building has been copied and replicated and used for all of those kinds of attributes that we associate with the Parthenon. Mathematics, science, reason, strength. And so this is the US Supreme Court building and it's uh, obviously. And Nashville built their own Parthenon, which is kind of cool. Anybody got a background story on why that is? I was talking about it in class, but I don't remember why they did it. Okay. Well, here's a thing that I learned from somebody who was a reporter for, uh, based in Nashville. And he says that the state of Tennessee is kind of looked at as in three different parts. And you've got the eastern part, which is Knoxville is in Chattanooga, are kind of the centers, and it's like Appalachia. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. It's a whole culture unto itself. The middle part, the biggest city is Nashville, and they always prided themselves and promoted this idea that they are the Athens of the South. It's where a lot of their universities are, Vanderbilt and so on. Uh, Nashville culturally was more educated and so on, especially 100, 150 years ago. And then you got Memphis, which is more or less a Mississippi Delta state, and its largest city is Memphis. And so it's almost like three different states. Memphis, by the way, has built a pyramid, and they identify more with the Egyptian ancient culture, being on the Nile versus being on the Mississippi River and so on. And so anyway, yeah, Nashville Parthenon, Lincoln Memorial. And if you've been downtown, you'll see this. This is a civil courts building and it's at Market and Tucker Streets. Or no, Pine, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, it's right there. It's like Caddy Corner from City Hall. And it is a large, tall building and on top we have a mini Greek temple which I always thought was kind of interesting uh, and that's right here and so as we were talking about the orders see and I'm not sure about these columns because the fluting on this Doric doesn't appear to be right I didn't notice that when I uploaded this picture. But this is the Corinthian that 
That appears in the Hellenistic period after this. But the two main types, as Charlotte was saying, was the Doric and the Ionic. And the Ionic was typically seen as more graceful, more feminine, and used in, in whatever appropriate building. And the Doric was seen as rugged, masculine, strong. Why is that important? They have put forth a concept or an idea that has been part of architecture ever since. That is that the building can have meaning. It can convey those kinds of messages about why this building is here. And I think that uh, it's been going on for some time, but the Greeks were the ones that that idea kind of crystallized. And they realized that a building can have as much meaning as a painting or a sculpture or a book. Anyway, here we are. And the, this is a little bit more accurate. You see how there's no flat space in the fluting. And this is the uh, Doric order, the Ionic order. And it's, anyway, just for saying, and so this, these are not the only buildings. Uh, and this is for in Italy, by the way, 550 BCE. The Greek Empire was actually pretty large, as you might imagine. And their influence outsized their actual, their actual empire. And so this was kind of the center of a lot of things. And so no big mystery why it was that the Persian civilization, which was owned modern day Turkey and Greece were kind of competing for supremacy. And so this, these are pediment sculptures. I kind of like this one. This is a little bit more in the archaic period. And if you take a look at these figures, again, what you find in the archaic period are sculptures that could have appeared as though they could have come out of South Asia. This could have been found on a Hindu temple. Stylistically proportioned everything. And so why am I saying this? Because if you do some research, you will find that the archaic and geometric periods are sometimes referred to as the Oriental period, and especially in that late archaic time. And so you can see they built extensively. Back here is an amphitheater. Uh, I've well, got some better pictures here. And Restored treasury, 530 BCE, and just like they were showing in the video, all of this stuff was painted. And so they were very colorful and probably as clean and pristine as what you see here. We have no doubt that they, uh, they their buildings just scream precision. And so one of the things I wanted to say here, and this is still kind of a, a, an issue, and that is that these painted sculptures, we know that a lot of the sculptures were originally painted. And there are some theories about exactly what kind of paint they use. Now they do a lot of microscopic testing of the surfaces and they're, they can get quite literally granular in trying to figure out what colors these were and what kind of paint. And one theory about this is that these 
these sculptures were painted with a kind of paint known as encaustic. Anybody know what encaustic? Shake a head. How about the folks at home? No. Nope. Encaustic is a kind of paint where the pigment is mixed with wax. Wow. Um, yeah. I have heard that before, actually. I'm sorry. Run that body again. I've heard it before. Oh, you did it. Good. It, is that Daphne? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, and here's the thing. Like, when you see these, these reproductions, this doesn't particularly look like it was painted with encaustic. Of course, it's just a model, but there's a compelling argument why these were painted with encaustic. And that is that wax and pigment can be made to look like natural human flesh. It reflects light in the same way that light reflects off your skin. Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. The reason they use wax is because of that quality. You can make that skin look incredibly spooky real. Uh, so anyway, that's what we think, at least uh, in the parts of of the human being, so. And so we have pottery from this time, and the big change in this, well, we still have the freezes, the registers telling the stories, um, and you can see this is from Italy, but again, influence. And what we have in, in the early Greek, pottery back in the archaic period are black figures that's how they that's how they made them everything was this kind of earthen colored pottery with black figures and here we go black figure amphora it's even listed that way and we know what an amphora is it's a vessel with carry water but uh, here we go. We start to see something else start to happen. And there's black figure, and then there's a white face on it. And so the Lysipides painter, Achilles and Ajax playing a dice game, is in black figure, and it's roughly 525 BCE. And we have the Andokides painter, and it's just the opposite. This is, we can see where this kind of painting on pottery changed, just like that, just like inventing the computer or something, or the cell phone, it was like huge. And playing a dice game and you see virtually the same, same scene. If you get an illustration that's kind of old, say like more than 10 years old, it won't say that they're playing a dice game. Because for years, maybe centuries, they said that they were playing drafts, D-R-A-U-G-H-T-S. You're shaking your head, Charlie. You hear that before? No, I, I just, oh, I okay. could picture the word in my head. <laughs> yeah, well, bottom line, drafts is kind of like checkers. And so I don't know why it's, they've changed what evidence they have, but Anyway, that's kind of a minor point, but what you see, we go from black figure to red figure pottery. And again, 
This is the painting we have remaining from this culture and we can know what they thought was important and oftentimes it's gods and warriors and that sort of things right out of their mythology. And see this is circa 515, it's a crater and it is red figure. Red figure, red figure. And we're getting newer and newer, CA 1490. I mean, excuse me, 490 BCE. And another illustration, the Metape, the Triglyph, that's all Doric, the Ionic basically just has a freeze, etc. This is the Corinthian, as I was saying earlier. This comes a little later. Hey. Yes. Yes. Oh. And so you can see this is this is developing, and we'll go back to the architecture. And this is just, you know, a few decades before the Parthenon. And so their sculpture starts to become more lifelike. As they were getting, as they were developing all of this knowledge of mathematics and science and philosophy, they were also developing their knowledge of the human anatomy. And so all of this stuff kind of rises up. It's like a snowball going downhill. It just keeps adding on. What they learn in science helps the people in medicine, helps the people in architecture, and blah, 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 and so on. I wanted to point this out because this is still looking a little archaic with the way the hair is done. It still looks a little bit more oriental, if you will. And I wanted to point this out. We talked about the head from Jericho and had the numbers written on the side. This is kind of what uh, another thing that they'll do. Drill a hole in his chest, put a steel rod in there so you can put the arm fragment in the right place. Just so. uh, this is more like what they do now. They have to prop it up. They'll find ways that are that you don't have to damage the pieces that you have. And this is a dying water uh, warrior, uh, 480 BCE, and we're getting real close to that classical period. And 460 BCE, we're right on it. Uh, Temple of Zeus. 470, again, becoming much more realistic, much more naturalistic. And so all of these, you see, this is a, these are pediment sculptures. They are in that triangular space above the entryway. And, uh, and so, yeah, we're really starting to get much more naturalistic. This, is, this guy has a very stylized, beard and what he has left of his hair but he's old he's kind of saggy a little bit it's much more natural and you can imagine this guy thinking he's a seer that is somebody who can who's a deep thinker and possibly could foretell the future more pediment sculptures, 470, 456, we're right here. We're in the classical period. Again, not so much a revolution, but an accelerated evolution. And Kratos point from the Acropolis and from this time period, 
And so we're starting to see these guys too, bronze sculptures. This is the Bronze Age after all. And it was a technology that was mostly employed for tools and for weaponry. And they started really making sculpture out of bronze. And this is how they did it. And we still use this today. And basically what you do, you see this white area, that is wax. You create a sculpture in wax and it's easy to manipulate. You can make it very detailed. You can do all of this kind of crazy patterning and stuff with the wax. And then you put rods or pins through it. You fill this outer part up with sand and you put sand in the center because your wax sculpture is hollow. You could keep that. You didn't, wouldn't have to put it in the center if you didn't want to, but it would be awfully heavy and cumbersome. So in order to make it light, you need less material. And so you pour the wax, or you pour the hot molten bronze which is really just a mixture of what? Copper and tin, I believe. Two very easy, malleable, low melting point metals. Um, and so, yeah, you pour it in there. That's why it's upside down, because it would come in this way. Bottom line is that that stuff is so hot, the wax evaporates, period. And then you let it cool off, you empty, take it out of the sand, empty the inside, polish it up, and you're in business. And so, yeah, here we go, another bronze statue. And so they got very good at this in a very short period of time. And Zeus or Poseidon, did I cut that off? I might have messed that slide up. But at any rate, you can see, look at this. One of the things that you could do with bronze is that you could make legs that didn't need some kind of support. If this were stone, this heavy body would make this statue break, probably at the ankles. It'd be so top heavy. But with bronze, you can see he's just putting a on his back leg, just putting the weight on the ball of his foot. That is like, it allows a lot more in terms of, and here is that kind of marble. I was talking about the legs. So you have to put something like a tree stump or something there so that this sculpture doesn't break. But this is one of the famous sculptors of classical Greece. His name's Myron. This is called the discus thrower, and it's from the Esquiline Hill in Rome. And it is a Roman copy of a bronze statue, circa 450 BC. So it's in the height. They have figured out that they didn't have to make the human figure stiff, rigid, you could see them actually engaged in whether it was the seer who was kicked back thinking about the future, Zeus or Poseidon, probably with a trident or something, a weapon of some sort, a spear, and in this case, an athlete. So talking about all of the things that have passed, through the ages from ancient Greece, the Olympics is one of them. And marathons are right out of ancient Greece. And there are stories behind both of them. But the idea with uh, the Greeks was that they were very interested in athletics. They were the original gymnasts. And 
They were primarily men, and they primarily did sport in the nude. So they had a whole different kind of idea than we have today. But anyway, the discus thrower, this is, and it was found in Rome because you'll see this on a lot of these statues. When the Romans came into power, sometimes they took the statues right off, right out of Athens or someplace, just, you know, took them back home. But more than that, they had a cooperative relationship with the Greeks. And Rome would send their sculptors to find these great ancient statues. And they would copy them. And they would copy them very precisely. They would use calipers and other measuring instruments and mark it all down and draw sketches and do everything. And that's where you have it. Roman copy of a bronze statue. And that's the way much of it survives. In the Parthenon video, they talked about Venice having been the government or the governing people of Athens and that the Turks, the Ottoman Turks were the ones that blew up the Parthenon. But this idea of Greek and Rome, they are really intertwined. They don't really fight each other. They kind of were allied. And the Romans had their own gifts and contributions, but they often look to the Greeks for inspiration and especially artistic inspiration. Spear bearer, and we don't have the spear. And again, this little, don't want to break that arm. So that's not a hit down plan. And again, tree stone. But from Pompeii and Roman copy, copy of a bronze statue, Pericles. The original was made by Pericles, who did this statue of Athena on the Parthenon. But at any rate, see, it's right from the high period. High naturalism, most complete understanding of science, math, nature. And here we go. There's, we just saw this on film, the aerial view of the Acropolis. And there's a restored view. Um, and again, you can see some of that painting going on there. And we already look at much of this in the film. Um, and this is why I say I'm not, there is some debate because oftentimes when you see these replicas or what they call restored models, they usually look like they're painted with enamel or something. It doesn't particularly look lifelike as, as it cost me. Anyway, um, And you see all of these, British Museum of London. And these are, this is all from the, what now took in the early 19th century. And this is from the East Pediment, Helios and his horses. And sometimes we don't know if it was Dionysus or Hercules. And in part because they don't oftentimes give us any markers, you know, like, like a scepter or a trident or something that tells us who these are. But at any rate, and these are the three goddesses. This is probably the most famous of all of the 
Parthenon pediment sculptures. And you can see this is like a high degree of realism in those. The way that the, the clothing just kind of drapes over the figures is just phenomenal. Exactly, yes. Yeah, I think I got this on here. Yes. Uh, I love this. Absolutely. And um, they call this kind of this kind of material, not the not the marble, but what it represents. Diaphanous. That means it's kind of thin and it's see through. And this is diaphanous clothing. And this is all Parthenon sculpture. Uh, when Eldon took these, he took a lot. And the video kind of touched on that without going into much detail. And it is something that they're still in dispute. And Greece is still, they expect to get these back. That's why they built that museum. And uh, probably in due course, maybe in your lifetime, you'll see those go back to Greece. It, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, on all sides. It, Maybe Lord Elgin saved them from being destroyed. But it wasn't just that. It's like the church. Like this is about like all of the art that's been stolen or conquered. Oh like, yeah. All of the art. Yes. Repatriation. Yeah. Absolutely. You can always make copies. You already have copies. That is correct. Make copies. When I saw those uh, Tomb of King Tut artifacts at the Science Center. Those were impeccable. Those were perfect replicas. Yeah, I, and you are so right. And I think that this is, not to get too political, but I think that our history gives, actually gives us a way to get into a lot of different subjects. That's a, no doubt about that. But I think that what we are going through right now in this country and worldwide is a reckoning. And this is part of the reckoning. These, these artworks belong to Greece. And we're taking a look at a reckoning in this country, how we deal with race. That's one of the big headlines in this day and age. And you know, the legacy of slavery and how do you completely get rid of, how do you fix that? Uh, systemic racism and so on. So the world, this is my take. If you don't like it, that's fine. I'm, I'm open for discussion. But I think that that is kind of pretty much how the world's going. And then there are a lot of people are pretty much Hey, not so fast. Let's think this through. Let's let's slow down a little bit. Let's, you know, and both are legit. Anyway, but politics, art, not diaphanous clothing, beautiful, and some more uh, pan. Then I uh, can't say it procession from the Parthenon. And as this is in the Acropolis Museum and the bottom one is from the Louvre in Paris. But you can see we're, they're getting there. And some more uh, Pantheon friezes. Again, we see this architecture live on. One of the things that happens out of this too is that eventually they start using statues as columns. As I was saying, there, there really wasn't any 
a real difference in, in the eyes of the Greeks between the statues that were part of the architecture and the architecture itself. It was all kind of one thing. And this is really a continuation of that idea. Uh, here we go. Another good example of that. And so 421, 405, right in the middle of the classical period. And oh, and what time is it? Yeah. Okay, I need to Nike adjusting their sandal. And brave Stella. We talked about Stella's. Um and so what we're getting into, this is late, this is this is kind of considered maybe the best of the classical Greek pottery. Uh, the Niobid painter, Artemis and Apollo. And, and in part, what's different about this is that these figures don't exist in a straight line or a frieze. They're just kind of floating around. And, and so that the detail, the craft, everything. This is classical Greek pottery. And so I have a lot more slides. Aphrodite. I just want to make sure. I had my Nike. Oh, is this the one you were talking yeah, about? Yeah. Okay, good. We'll talk about that next time. We'll do Hellenistic Greece Monday. Any questions? Uh, can we go? Yes. All right. That's the last of the questions. I have a good weekend, y'all. And be safe and all of that. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome.